If you're over 30, and I'm a lot over 30, and if you're anything like me, occasionally you get the urge to revisit things from your childhood that you fondly remember. Nostalgia. <laughs> I think this might be my oldest possession that I have. I'll bring it a little closer. I'm a chipmate, the Chip Book Club. This was a badge I got in Primary 5, which was my favourite primary in my youth. And can you remember in primary school, I don't know if they do this nowadays, but in my day, every month or two, everybody got a little booklet, which was filled with books that you could mail order through your school and through your teacher. And it was really fun looking through them and picking out what I wanted to order. There was the Chip Club and then there was the Puffin Book Club, I remember, from Primary 7. But, uh, yeah, so there's a book I remember and I was just immediately taken by the cover of it and it was this. Okay, Star. I love it when these old books have these like shiny silver bits. You don't get that so much nowadays. But I was completely arrested being a typical... I don't know, eight or nine year old or whatever I was, I was completely taken with the, this cover. You know, being a Star Wars fan and everything. Was Star Wars out then? I'm sure it was, yeah. So this was published I think in 1980, yeah, Star Wars was out. So it kind of looks like it's a TV show. And I can remember thinking, is this some kind of TV show, a book based on a TV show and I've missed the show? Because it looks fantastic, you know, kids in outer space, in a spaceship. But no, there's no TV show of the Star Stormers uh, by Nicholas Fisk. <laughs> um, this is probably just some kind of photo shoot that was set up with these four kids. And for all I know, that's stuff above their head, which is the interior of their spaceship, which is from, made out of a hollowed out meteorite. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, it's probably just bin liners or paper mache or something, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I've decided to make a video about the Star Stormer saga by Nicholas Fisk. Now this guy, he lived until 2016, I think he was born in the 1920s. He seems to be a forgotten children's science fiction author. Um, people like John Wyndham and John Christopher will never be forgotten. Type those names into YouTube and you will find numerous videos but type Nicholas Fisk and there's almost nothing. There's a couple of things. Someone recently uploaded an audiobook of Trillions, which is one of his other books. Uh, and I saw one review of one Nicholas Fisk book by another, by another uh, booktuber. And that's all I could find. <laughs> so, where, what happened to Nicholas Fisk? Where, where's the love? Where's the love, folks, for Nicholas Fisk? So anyway, being a nine-year-old or whatever, I bought this book, and being a stupid nine-year-old, I never read it. You know, I just liked the cover. But I wasn't one of these kids who was a bookworm. Uh, very hard for me to actually read anything more than the Eagle comic, which is what I liked to read back in those days. Um, but I, I own volume one, and I probably didn't read it until the reading bug really hit me around the age 13, 14. And by that stage, I had started reading books by like Stephen King, James Herbert even. Yeah, I know those are for adults, but I was reading them in my early to mid-teens. And so this, I read it at that time and thought, oh my goodness, this is really good. I like it. I was surprised. Why didn't I read it when I first got it? Because I was stupid. And... Uh, but it felt really out of place among my growing collection of horror and science fiction books for adults. You know, this little kitty book. And I think I threw my copy out, stupidly. So, around 2008, over a decade ago, I decided to hunt down Star Stormers again on eBay and I found a copy. I could always remember, see it says volume one here, I could always remember that there were five volumes. I only ever ordered the first one because I guess you only had a chance to, to order, well as far as your parents were concerned they were only going to let you buy one book at a time. So maybe in the next issue of the book club there was Star Stormers 2 but I couldn't 
get to buy it because I wanted something else. I remember buying the BMX handbook or something like that, you know? So I may have seen these possibly on the shelves of my local bookshop, but I definitely remember there were five of them. So I set about obtaining all five and I have them here. So let's take a look at the other covers. This is Sunburst. I think they're looking out of the porthole of their ship. Yeah, it's a very weird ship, but we'll get to that. And uh, volume three is Catfang. Volume four, Evil Eye. And volume five is Volcano. You can see how these are very appealing to, to kids or big kids like me. <laughs> so this is the whole saga. What's it all about? Well, it concerns four kids. And if I look on the back, you actually get a close up look at who these four are. We have Vaughn, who is sort of the empathic one among the crew. And I think that's something that gets her into trouble later, if I remember correctly, because she's sort of psychically sensitive. And there's Icebex, who's the scientific one. Take a look at those glasses. He's sort of the nerdy sort of scientist. We have Sue, spelt with a T-S-U. She's the oriental girl, or Asian girl, I should say. And she's sort of very quiet and reserved and has a sort of severe personality. And then we have Mackenzie here who's kind of like the muscle, he's like the hard guy. <laughs> so it's all very, you know, but you know, the, the characters of these kids are really fun. There's also another character who's not featured on the back. He's on the cover of volume four. This weird looking thing here that's glowing, that's Shambles, the robot. Very much modeled after uh, the droids of Star Wars. You know, it's kind of, he's sort of R2-D2-esque. Um, and he has his own little personality. He's always saying pardon and he's always stuttering and falling over and stuff. Um, the books are, are good. Well, they start off good. Let me put it that way. This is a really good little children's space opera, this first volume. And the story goes like this. I'll just, I'll not give you much in the way of spoilers, but I'll just set the scene for you. Um, these four kids live on Earth in a boarding school in the future. Their parents are all on a faraway planet called Epsilon Cool, where they are setting up the first human colony there. So the kids had to stay behind because the work was being done there and it wasn't gonna be suitable conditions for the kids. They get really frustrated at being left behind on Earth. So they decide they're going, to, this, is where, this is where your suspension of disbelief is required. They decide to build their own spaceship and take off for Epsilon Cool. So they find a hollowed out meteorite. It kind of ends up in, like, being in kind of the shape of a snail. And uh, they fit it with all kinds of components that they get from a spacecraft junkyard. Yeah, so they make an actual spacecraft and they sneak away and take off for Epsilon Cool. En route, they encounter a spacecraft, a massive starship called the Conqueror, which was from Earth. And when they're on board, they find that the inhabitants have been kind of enslaved to some sort of religion where they are worshipping beings called the Glorious Ones. And there seems to be a hierarchy on the ship where the captain and his officers have become kind of priests. So it sounds like a kind of grown-up story here. But and I suppose it kind of is involving religion and religion as a means of control. But <laughs> there is a kind of a hokey side to the whole thing. So that, that sort of sets the scene for, for volume one, which I highly recommend, especially uh, because towards the end of it, well, I would, no spoilers, but there was a kind of a jaw dropping uh, betrayal that happens towards the end of this, which made this a really, really great novel, highly recommended. Volume two then, Sunbursts, Sunburst, sees the crew of the Star Stormer, that's the name of their ship. Uh, they come across a derelict starship, not the same one as in the first novel, but, and they, they land on this thing and dock with it. 
only to discover to their horror that it's heading into the sun or to a nearby star and they can't get away they're stuck and they assume that they're stuck because of the high gravity of the starship they can't seem to take off and this is where the story kind of got a bit stupid for me because they realized in the end that they forgot to uncouple the docking mechanism right? so hmm that's not really much of a spoiler because that adventure on the starship only takes around the first 40 pages of the book it's a short they're all short books about 100 to 110 pages and then we have another adventure in the second half of the book I won't tell you anything about that um, this was okay not bad but the signs of a decline in quality are apparent and it kind of bugs me because you know I think the author well no, it's, I wouldn't call that a plot hole, but it's just it's not a very well-constructed plot, that thing I told you about, forgetting the docking mechanism. Come on now. Number three, Cat Fang, and the star of the show, no surprise, is this little kitty, who they name Fang, hence Cat Fang. So anyway, the Star Stormers are in flight again, the main enemy of the whole saga is someone called the Octopus Emperor who comes from, he's, he's like a being made out of dust and he comes from a planet of dust. And this is kind of reminiscent of another book that Nicholas Fisk wrote that I only read recently. I caught it going cheap on Kindle and I bought it. It's called Trillions, which is all about uh, present day here on Earth. This strange sparkly dust falls from the sky in huge amounts localized to a particular town, coastal town in England and nobody knows what it is except uh, if you put it beside something it starts to mimic that thing the dust seems to crawl along and form itself into shapes and if you put it under a microscope it looks like little gears you know the little teeth and gears uh, all different colors and it's, so it has some kind of conscious intelligence. So intelligent dust is a theme that Nicholas Fisk uses again here in the Star Stormer saga. Um, so the cat is a stowaway on board the Star Stormer ship, while the Star Stormers, while while the ship is being bombarded by attacks from enemy spacecraft, and. It gets really weird. <laughs> so, how do they get out of it? Here's what I remember about this, and bear in mind, it's been like over 10 years since I, since I read this. I got the feeling that Nicholas Fisk was sort of contractually obliged to do five volumes of this, and the first one was really good, but he didn't really know what to do with the rest of them, and he was struggling, I think, to get a good plot together here in Catfang. This is a guess, by the way. So he got to a certain point and he thought, oh, Gary, have you got any of that really good, really good stuff? Because I'm, I'm fresh out of ideas here. So he, he lights one up and he's like, okay, I'm seeing something now. Yeah, okay. The cat, the cat gets itself all mixed up in the wiring of the ship that's kind of hanging down and gets gets all gets its body all caught in the wiring and he, the cat can see through the viewfinder the ships that are attacking and when he pulls on certain wires it, it, it actually makes you know when, when he moves his body in certain ways and it pulls on certain wires it directs the ship's lasers so it can fire really accurately and the cat starts firing and hitting all the other enemy ships just by moving itself around in this tangle of wire. Oh, I'm the best author ever. Right, Gary, where's my typewriter? <laughs> so, Nicholas Fisk, what were you smoking when you wrote this book, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's weird. It's weird, it's kind of fun though, I went with it, uh, but again, mm, we're starting to go downhill with Cat Fang. Volume 4, 
evil eye. The ship crash lands on a planet called Moloch. And if any of you know your Bible, um, Moloch in the Old Testament was some kind of demonic entity, some false god who was worshipped, who had a particular taste for child sacrifices. Hmm? Okay, so this is a jungle planet where nature seems to have run amok and it's all about survival against the animal population of the planet. Uh, yeah, it was okay. We meet another sort of strange creature that's kind of like a disembodied sort of consciousness uh, called the Veils of Moloch that I immediately sort of thought were going to be uh, the bad guys given the name Moloch but uh, they're actually helpful creatures so <laughs> go figure why Nicholas Fisk called called the planet Moloch and called them the Veils of Moloch but uh, it was a fun sort of little adventure but again um, nothing special in comparison to the first one lastly we have Volcano, and I can't remember what the cover illustration really relates to, uh, but I think it has something to do with the veils of Moloch. Yeah, they're back again. So it's another crash landing on a planet called Volcano, only it turns out they haven't crash landed into the planet, they've actually crash landed into uh, a satellite that was orbiting the planet, a satellite that had a, like a controlled atmosphere and a kind of jungle interior and all I could think was if you crashed into this uh, wouldn't you have kind of voided the atmosphere into space and Nicholas Fisk has no comment to make about that and this is the kind of the thing that annoys me about the series is all the plot holes everywhere and I think the mentality of the author may have been kids won't notice which is a pity because there are other children's authors who construct very good children's fiction, such as John Christopher. Think of his Tripods trilogy, The Prince in Waiting, um, Wild Jack, The Lotus Caves. Brilliant books. No plot holes. <laughs> so, even while this is fun for me, it was way more fun in Volume 1 than it is in Volume 5. We've got the Octopus Emperor back. Uh, and it's really just a wrap-up volume to kind of tie things off and come to a final conclusion. Uh, so yeah, at this stage, I was just kind of thinking, okay, let's just get it. We've come this far, let's just get it done. <laughs> so, I've read these five books by Nicholas Fisk. They are fun in a limited, in a limited sort of way. Um, kids will be way more forgiving than adults will. They certainly look great. You can probably chase these up if you feel nostalgic about them on eBay. They've had various covers, but this this is the Night Books edition, uh, which might be its first publication. Oh, I do think they had a hardcover before they were in paperback. Yeah. So, I mean, nostalgia demands that I, I don't really want to sell these. I want to keep them because it's just... It just takes me back to childhood, even though <clears throat> I only read Volume 1 and I only read it in my mid-teens. <laughs> okay. The only other book I've read by Nicholas Fisk is, uh, and I read it recently, is uh, Time Trap, which was interesting. It was about a, a boy in the future, a kind of dystopian future, where uh, things are very highly controlled, sort of 1984 style, you know. Uh, his grandfather discovers a way to use a drug to time travel and the boy goes back to something like the 19, 1940s rural England or something like that and he gets really attached to the family he's with and he just loves just even though it's hard work living living on a farm it's just the sun beating down on you the countryside he just falls in love with with that and he hates having to go back again and there are other adventures to, into the into his future, which gets even more dystopian. It gets very much like A Clockwork Orange, uh, which is a kind of a bizarre choice for a children's book. But of course, it is watered down 
the violence in it is is watered down in comparison to the real Clockwork Orange movie or book. Uh, but it's definitely definitely inspired by a Clockwork Orange because it has young people with a kind of coming up with their own slang language, like it was in A Clockwork Orange. That was a fun book, yeah. One of the better books by him that I've read. But yeah, I just thought I'd make this because Nicholas Fisk seems to be a forgotten children's author. And I do think he's worth checking out. Alright folks, take care.